What's going on guys, Ben Brewster here at TreadAthletics.com. Today we're going to be breaking down Diego Castillo's mechanics, or some people like to pronounce it. Diago. Which of course in German means. That being said, let's get into the video. So we've gotten a lot of requests to do his mechanics. He's a little bit funky. He does a couple things differently. Obviously he's sitting close to 100 miles an hour. So we're going to get into exactly how he's able to produce that velocity, what he's doing well, maybe a couple things that he's doing not so well or a little bit uniquely. Um, but first let's go over some quick facts. So he listed at six foot three. Uh, he's a big boy, 250 pounds. He's 26 years old, and he's been in the big leagues for a couple of years now. He debuted in June of 2018. As far as pitch velocity and usage, obviously he's got that fastball. He actually doesn't throw the four seam much at all anymore. He threw it about 1.2% this year, averaged 97 miles an hour on it. But he's getting about the same velocity, averaging 96.8 with the sinker, which he throws 37% of the time. So still not really a fastball pitcher anymore, uh, even though he was when he maybe entered the league a couple of years ago. So what he's really relying on is that slider, which he throws about 87 miles an hour and throws a little over 60% of the time. He used to have a changeup, which he scrapped, and it's easy to see why with the slider's results. So he's getting a 51.2% whiff percentage, and batters hit just 0.087 against him this year. Um, so that really was kind of his put away pitch, which is you know crazy to say for a guy that's throwing 100 miles an hour uh, pretty regularly. Pretty standard fastball slider guy. He gets a lot of horizontal movement on that sinker as well. You know, you can see again why he's so filthy with this pitch on the right, 101 miles an hour. Uh, looks easy, looks effortless. Um, so let's get into mechanically what he's doing, which maybe helps him produce some of that mechanical efficiency and create some of that velocity. Because if you guys have been following the channel for any period of time, you know that you know, I'm not necessarily a believer that all these guys are just purely genetic freaks. A lot of them are genetically gifted, but they're also moving extremely efficiently. And so examining some of that movement efficiency can help give us kind of a lens into how to improve our own performance, how to improve our own career, whether you're high school, college, or professional guy yourself. So let's start off by looking at his leg lift. Let's see if anything is going on there that's that's maybe a little bit different, a little bit unique. The first thing that I, I kind of wrote down and noted, he gets a very slight coil, but it's nothing too crazy, right? There's a very slight turn into that uh, into that back hip with the leg lift. It's a relatively high leg kick, but what's interesting and, and something that we've noticed uh, amongst a very large percentage of 100 mile an hour throwers is that during that, the peak of their leg lift, they get this stack, they stay tall, they keep a quiet head, and they're stacked over the pelvis, but they get kind of this posterior uh, rotation of the pelvis. So as they get to the leg lift, they stay tall, but they also kind of tuck their butt underneath them a little bit and kind of preload the pelvis. And so you can kind of see that here with the pelvis kind of tucking underneath him. During that initial leg lift, tall, stacked, and that pelvis, again, is tucking underneath him, um, which you know we feel plays a role in kind of preloading the ensuing linear move as you kind of drive into a little bit of anterior tilt and coil, kind of starting with that posterior tilt seems to help give you something to sit into as you drop into the hinge. So um, that's just kind of our theory, but again, just pretty standard leg lift, nothing too crazy going on there. So we take a look at the side view of his leg lift. There's two more things I do want to mention. If you've been following the channel, you, you understand the concept of the drift or during the leg lift, we're ideally looking for a slight shifting of the center of mass forward rather than kind of a balance point or even worse, a balance point with tipping the pelvis and reaching with the hips. If we go through his leg lift, he gets a little bit of a forward move. It's not too, not too aggressive, but he does kind of tip the pelvis just a little bit. So this angle right here is a little more than we would typically like to see. Maybe that's 20, 25 degrees. Typically during the leg lift, we're trying to keep that pelvis as underneath us as possible uh, as far as like kind of that front to back angle. So from a side view, we're trying to keep it within 10, 15 degrees of the horizon. And so he does tip it a little bit uphill. He does get a little bit reachy. Um, but again, it's one of those rules where it's not so hard and fast. There's always these series of trade-offs when it comes to high velocity. Um, maybe you do one thing that's not perfectly efficient, but you make up for it elsewhere. And we're gonna talk about this in a second, but he makes up for it elsewhere in the ensuing linear move in the hinge with some outrageous hip internal rotation, outrageously efficient and deep positions that he gets into. So uh, I just wanted to mention that when, you know, if you notice like, hey, he's not doing the whole drift thing. It's not like 100% of 100 mile an hour throwers do have an aggressive drift like a Jacob deGrom or a Nolan Ryan. It's always a series of give and takes. So let's get into his linear move now. So we talked about his leg lift and his first move. Let's look at his linear move, which is kind of that middle piece of the lower half. And let's look at what he's able to do there, which is maybe more efficient than the average, you know, 92, 93 mile an hour pitcher. So if we look at a back view, and this is one reason that I think back views or you know your standard broadcast view can be a little bit deceptive depending on which uh, which mechanical variable that you're trying to look at. Right, a front or back view is really helpful when looking at kind of the, the arm slot, the release point, you know, the, the degree of scap loading. There's a lot of things you can tell from a back view, but one of the things you can't really tell is how they're loading their pelvis. You can't really see it as well. So a lot of people would see this and think, oh, he's just kind of sitting into his back leg, but you can't really appreciate 
the amount of coil that's going on from this angle. So if you look at a side view, we can see a ton of internal rotation going on. So I wrote it down here, but extreme hip IR during the load. So again, it's not here, it's as he drops into his lower half here, this is the position um, that you know I would say makes him special or that makes him unique relative to other pitchers that you'll see. He has an extreme degree of hip internal rotation mobility and he's fully accessing that when he throws. What he's doing is basically he's as he drops into that back leg, his pelvis is going from this posterior tilt to anterior tilt and counter rotation. So he gets from here with his pelvis and as he drops into his back leg, he's coiling further over his back hip and he's dropping into anterior tilt. So this is an extreme position of hip IR right there. For those of you who don't quite understand what that is um, or how, how this is IR, I'll get to that in a second. One thing I will mention is that guys who have this much mobility have a tendency to get a little bit over rotated. And what I mean by over rotated is, so you can think of a guy like maybe Madison Bumgarner, where as he's moving towards the target, he's, his upper half is all the way back here. Guys who have such good hip internal rotation, they end up getting a ton of pelvic coil and so the torso follows that. As they move forward, they end up basically showing their numbers to the batter. And what can happen is if you get too much counter rotation all the way back here, it can be really tough to get out of that position versus keeping a little bit more direction towards the target so that you have a good efficient unload and you can actually line up the plane of rotation into ball release. So again, he manages to get out of this position, but just take a look at how much counter rotation he has, right? He's not getting this counter rotation from just taking his T-spine and flexing it this way. The T-spine is staying relatively in line with the pelvis. This is all kind of one unit during the drive. He's getting to that crazy position right here, that crazy counter rotation, because his pelvis is taking him there. His torso is following his pelvis, but his pelvis is doing this over his femur. His femur is here and his pelvis is rotating over top of it like that. And so because he has such extreme mobility, there is a tendency for certain guys to get really, really over rotated. And this goes hand in hand with uh, one of the common kind of things we'll play with with our remote athletes is this back foot position on the rubber. So if we assess a guy on a table, we assess his hip internal rotation and we see that he's got 55, 50, 60 degrees of hip internal, something very, very high like Diego Castillo, then a lot of times we'll take a look at what their back foot is doing on the rubber. Typically we like to see is that foot is either even with the rubber, or a lot of times we'll actually play with turning that toe in 10 to 15 degrees. And what that does, if, if you can imagine, basically if your foot is even with the rubber, but you have a ton of IR, and for you to fully load your pelvis, and I've got good IR myself, so I can kind of demonstrate this, you're basically turn, your pelvis is gonna have to turn a lot further than if you preset the toe in slightly. Now when you load the pelvis, your pelvis instead of being all the way back here as you move towards the target, it's a little bit more online with the target. This is why you wouldn't want to take a guy like Diego Castillo and tell him to face his toes, you know, 30 degrees back uh, towards the rubber, is because now if he fully loads that, his pelvis is basically going to be facing second base if he fully gets into his back hip, into the IR. Guys with great IR, it's just one of those things we will kind of split test and play with two different foot positions on the rubber. Again, it's one of those things, if it helps, it helps. If it hurts, we're going to stick with what, what they're doing. But that's one of the things we commonly see a quick velo spike for guys like that just by slightly adjusting the toe position and it's something that helped me in college as well as soon as i did that i saw an immediate two to three mile an hour spike and it's just because i was able to get in a slightly better position with my pelvis by adjusting the position of the back femur from the very start of the throw so some of you are probably undoubtedly watching this and a little bit confused what i mean by internal rotation on that back hip because you've kind of been taught this vertical shin philosophy, which isn't, I'm not saying is wrong, but you've been taught that anytime you see this type of angle on the back foot, that means that they're in external rotation. So I wanna do a kind of a, a little bit of an exercise with you guys to help explain exactly why this is internal rotation and help you guys feel uh, kind of the position that he's putting himself in. Again, I'm not saying you need to get to this position yourself, um, but I just want you to understand that this is internal rotation. So I want you to stand up. I want you to just stand completely neutral, normal, straight up and down. Okay, right now your hips are in a position of neutral rotation. There's no internal, there's no external, you're, you're in anatomical neutral, All right, as far as the position of your pelvis to your femur. Now I want you to widen your feet out, maybe five feet apart, like you're in a stride. Toes straight ahead, pelvis right underneath you, stand tall. We're still in neutral, we've just added hip abduction. That's the abduction portion of the linear move. Now I want you to basically squat down, hinge slightly, just Bend your knees, bend your hips. 
Now we've added hip flexion, we've added knee flexion. So we have those components. We have the hip flexion, the knee flexion, and the abduction. We're still in neutral though. So what actually dictates whether we're in IR or ER? Well, what would ER look like? ER would be if we took our belt buckle and we rotated it away from the back knee. Clearly he's not doing that. Clearly his belt buckle is not facing this way. Another thing that ER would be is if we took that knee and we shot it way back towards second base. So if this knee was way further back that way, that would also be ER. But that's not what's happening either. His knee, his, his foot is even with the rubber and his belt buckle is facing this way. So we're in this position, we're in neutral, and we gotta get our belt buckle facing about 45 degrees that way. So what do we do? We take our belt buckle, we, we rotate it 45 degrees over that back femur. What do you feel in the back, what do you feel in the back hip? You're gonna feel a coiling in the back hip. If you've got terrible hip mobility or really bad IR, you might feel a pinch. So obviously don't hurt yourself. But what we're doing here, just by turning the pelvis over top of that back femur, you're now in relative hip internal rotation. And he's in quite a bit of hip internal rotation as he gets to the peak of that linear move. So that feeling that you're feeling in the back hip right now, if you, if you were to replicate that just standing right upright, that's in the exact same position, roughly the same position or same amount of IR as this. This position here is the same, it's just changing the fixed point from my foot being uh, mobile to my foot being fixed on the ground and the pelvis being mobile over top of that femur. So hopefully that helps you guys kind of conceptualize and feel in your own body why he's in internal rotation here. There are pitchers who don't get anywhere near this amount of internal rotation. Justin Verlander is a good example where he's probably closer to neutral or even possibly in a little bit of external rotation as he moves down the mound. But again, it's that relative position of where's the pelvis and then where's the femur relative to the pelvis. And that relationship between the two is how you know if you're an IR neutral or ER. All right, so we've talked about his very internal rotation dominant linear move towards the target, but how does he get from that maximal load position downhill and actually to his release point? What does his unload look like? The first thing I think it's important to realize is that you know he's trying to hold this load as long as possible down the mound. If we look at a front view here and we say, okay, when does his pelvis actually start to, to trigger? And my, my opinion, he's close, 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 close. Right here is when it starts to trigger. So it's only a couple of frames before landing that he actually starts to trigger the pelvis. It's a very, very late unload. Again, my opinion, what I feel when I've thrown hard um, and in working with a lot of pitchers that have thrown 95 plus is that it's much more of a holding the tension as long as you can and then releasing the pelvis into landing versus holding that tension and trying to force the hips open or actively rotate the hips open. It's loading and then releasing. He's releasing that tension very late. He's releasing the pelvis very late. So what's actually happening when he releases that pelvis into rotation is it's not the femur driving into IR and then that triggering the pelvis to unload. Because remember, we're already in maximum IR. He's already in that position that you just felt where it's, he's in maximum IR. So how are you gonna drive the knee down more from there? You can't, you're already in maximum IR. So how do you get from that position to hips open, shoulders closed at landing? Well, what happens is you unload the pelvis and the pelvis brings that back knee, brings the back hip with it. So the pelvis unloads and it brings it all together in one unit and everything drives downhill from there. So again, it's, it looks on video that's deceptive, but it looks like this knee drives down and then that triggers the pelvis to go but it's actually not, it's actually the opposite. The pelvis is already loaded into IR, the pelvis goes, and as the pelvis is going, it brings that back hip alongside with it. And again, not a hitting guy, but everything that I've observed is that this is a very similar move in hitting in terms of the unload of the pelvis. Um, so I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate for saying that in the comments, so go ahead, leave your comment if you disagree. Um, but again, that's my interpretation of what's happening is loading into IR, pelvis is released into landing and it brings along the back hip with it. Another helpful cue if you're struggling to get out of your load, for example, you aren't able to get the hips open into landing or maybe you're trying to force the hips open and you're feeling like it's get, making you very rotational, is this idea of rotating down into landing. So he's roughly at the peak of his load right here. He's, he's gotten into IR, he's gotten as far as his body will allow. And so now that rotation is triggered. So how do I get from here to there? The idea is rotating down into landing or landing from above. And the idea is basically, we get to this peak load. From here, you're trying to feel that pelvis 
rotate down into landing. It's not gonna actually do this, but it's this idea of, can I get from here, downhill, here, downhill, and it's basically encouraging this north to south, tight rotation down this narrow hallway, um, you know, rotating through a narrow window, all these different things that you've heard before. Uh, we just like to think of it as rotate down into landing versus spin open into landing. Obviously, you're not actually gonna have the pelvis do that, but it's kind of this, it's still this idea of, hey, the front of his pelvis is a little bit elevated relative to the back. At landing, it's gonna be a little bit reversed. And so it's still this very much this feeling of can I rotate down into landing, which gives you a much firmer front leg to block versus spinning into that front leg. That knee has a tendency to bow out. The foot has a tendency to bow out versus if you can land from above, you have a very, uh, very easy front leg block. The front leg just naturally does what you want it to do. You have a very uh, stable base to rotate over. So again, just something helpful for you guys. I don't know if he's thinking that cue specifically, but how you get from here to there, it can be very helpful to think rotate down into landing. So the next thing I wanna to touch on, we have a couple more things and then we're gonna be done with the video, is this idea of hip to shoulder separation. Now there's this common thought that you can kind of force separation. Uh, we've gotten away from drills like roll-ins a little bit where the, the cue is to force the hips all the way open, force the shoulders all the way closed, hold that and just kind of brute force and bully that separation into happening. In reality, the spine doesn't really work that way. The spine works in kind of the spinal engine concept. Um, I'll link a, link a couple videos in the description below to explain what that is, but um, basically it's this idea of you're unleashing this energy segmentally up the spine, and it's not, a, it's not a forced mechanism of the spine. It's one of those things where you're trying to dynamically kind of unload the whip uh, segment by segment. And so se the separation is occurring because he's closed off with the pelvis, he's closed off with the shoulders, and then at the last second he's releasing the tension from the hips, but the shoulders are still back here. So he's still got the shoulders back, but he's released this tension from the hips. He hasn't gone through his delivery trying to force his hips open, hold his shoulders closed, and then throw awkwardly and robotically. He's closed, he's loading, he's closed, he's loading. Then he's releasing that tension, letting the pelvis unload underneath the torso. And it creates this very elastic dynamic separation versus this forced separation. So uh, what's interesting in talking to a couple uh, uh, biomechanics experts who have studied this to some extent, when they actually test guys in a lab and they tell them to force the separation through something like a roll-in, they actually get less separation than when they don't do that. When they do something that encourages this pelvic loading and unloading process, it actually creates more separation when the, than when guys actively try to create more separation. So just interesting how that works. And again, he's a great example of loading the pelvis and then letting it unload down into landing before the torso has, has time to open. And that's, that's the pelvic to torso dissociation that we talk about, that we have in our remote assessments, and that we wanna make sure the athlete actually has the capacity in his body to allow the pelvic, uh, pelvic motion, pelvic rotation to occur independent of the thorax. So we need to be able to have the pelvis move underneath the torso, and we need to be able to move the torso independent of the pelvis, or this is never gonna happen. Even if you know in your mind what you're trying to do, it's just not gonna happen. So you need both the capacity within your body, within your joints, uh, but you also need, need the patterning aspect of it. You need to understand what it means to load and unload your pelvis with good timing while keeping the torso back and letting it add to the throw at the very last second. So um, that's just kind of a little, little spiel on separation and just talking about mobility a little bit. This was something we, uh, addressed a little bit on Twitter this past week. Follow us on Twitter, by the way, if you haven't already. Um, but this concept of cervical mobility and thoracic mobility being so important, I think we can see a little bit better from the front view. But as he unloads into landing, right, he's unloading down into landing, watch this insane thoracic extension and rotation that he's having to access to get from this loaded position back downhill at release. It's very difficult to get from this hunched over loaded position to stacked at landing and downhill at release if you don't have the capacity to rotate and extend into release. So for me to hold my shoulders closed as I let the pelvis go, I'm gonna be in a crazy amount of thoracic rotation glove side. It's this idea 
This is thoracic rotation glove side. It's not forced, you're just holding everything closed, pelvis goes, and now you're in this extreme position of relative T-spine rotation and extension. So that's the first thing. Cervical rotation is the second thing. As he's rotating here, he's in basically as much cervical rotation as he can possibly be. So what we routinely see is the guys who have kind of screwed up posture, maybe they have a forward head posture, sway back posture, and they don't have the ability to get full cervical rotation, 80, 90 degrees, something like that, is they don't have the ability to keep their eyes on the target as they're unloading. And so what they do is they actually come out of their, their torso early. They, they fly open with their torso early most of the time so that they can actually keep their eyes on the target. Versus if they have a little bit better cervical rotation mobility, they can keep their eyes on the target a little bit longer as they unload. And therefore, they can keep that, they can hold that counter rotation. And a lot of times you'll see better separation, better timing when you free up a guy's cervical mobility. So just two additional points that I wanted to mention. All right, three more points, then I'm gonna let you guys get out of here. Uh, the first one, uh, they're all in regards to arm action. So the first one is the relationship between his throwing arm and his glove arm. Um, we routinely hear two camps on this in the pitching world. One camp, kind of the old school camp, says the throwing arm and the glove arm should perfectly mirror each other. And the other camp says, you know, no, that's not true. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter if the, the throwing arm and the glove arm mirror each other. They should actually work completely independently of one another. And there's not really a huge relationship between the two. You know, I think Diego Castillo is a good example of this. I'm not saying that the throwing arm and the glove arm have to perfectly mirror each other where they're perfectly in sync and they both tuck and retract at the exact same time. That's not what I'm saying. No high level thrower does that where they actually retract at the same time. There is gonna be a retraction of the, of the throwing arm first and then that glove arm screws in and maximizes that scap loading and helps deliver the torso in plane. But he's just a good example of the throwing arm and the glove arm do work in opposition to each other and they do have to work together in order to properly sink the torso and sink the arm into the plane of rotation at landing. And what I mean by that is He's getting into this relatively long arm swing right here. It's not gonna sync up if he suddenly decides he wants to have a chicken wing glove arm on the front arm. It's also not gonna sync up with a long reaching glove arm and he decides he wants to have a super, super tight, uh, restricted, uh, no elbow flexion arm swing on the back end. It's possible there's a couple pitchers in the past who've been successful. Jake Peavy is an example. Um, but as far as maximizing pure efficiency as a thrower, you want the two to have some, that need to work in opposition. Whether or not that means perfectly mirroring each other, if you're gonna have some elevation on the glove arm, you're typically gonna have a little bit of a lower arm swing. If you're gonna have a short glove arm, like a Joe Kelly, you want that to pair up with a shorter arm swing on the back end. If you're gonna have a more horizontal glove break, you're typically gonna have a more horizontal arm swing as well. So they do need to work in somewhat of opposition to, to one another. You can see not per, they're not perfectly matching each other, but he's doing a really good job of setting that glove arm here, loose arm swing on the back end. Again, you can still see They are working in opposition to each other. The glove arm helps sink into the plane of his shoulders. So as his torso begins to rotate down into landing, the glove arm sinks into that plane. It's not pulling him way off to the side and getting outside of the plane. It's just screwing into the same plane of rotation. And the throwing arm, same thing. This is his plane of rotation, right about this axis. Everything is screwing into that exact same plane. So. Uh, if someone ever says that equal and opposite doesn't matter, that's true to some extent, but they do need to work in opposition. It can't just be one, one doing one thing, the other completely doing another thing. Again, everything has to ultimately sync up at landing and into the plane of rotation to be the most effective, most efficient at transferring energy. The next thing that some of you might be noticing or, or seeing is, hey, at landing, doesn't his arm look late? Like, isn't this a problem that his arm's down here at landing and the front foot looks like it just touched down? Um, my answer to that is maybe, it's possible that's an issue, but what we typically look for is the position of the arm when the front foot actually accepts weight. And so if that front foot has barely tapped down and the arm's still a hair, hair low, but right when that front leg actually accepts weight, accepts that load, it's up, typically that's not as much of an issue. So let's look at what happens one frame later. So a frame later that front foot has accepted weight and the arm is up. So I wouldn't necessarily look at him and say that's something that needs to be changed or that's something that you could really predict an arm injury based off of. Who knows what'll happen in the next, you know, two, three, 10 years with his arm and his health. Um, but I don't think that you can necessarily predict an injury based on that. Again, if somebody has a research study that I'm not aware of, feel free to link that in the comments below. Happy to learn. Um, but again, that's not something that we look for in our athletes as a huge red flag, as long as when the front foot actually accepts weight 
is the arm up. And then number three is this concept of directing intensity or intent through the tip of the whip. And you can think of this in a couple different ways. This, when, when you see somebody throwing 100 and you think, oh wow, that looks so effortless, it looks so easy, this is one of the reasons why. It's because they've built up all this energy from their lower half through their torso, into their arms, spiraling out and around, and then at release, they have a very quiet head, very quiet torso. It's because all the energy has actually made its way out through the tip of the whip, and they're not trying to brute force their finish by yanking their torso, yanking their head, yanking their arm as one big blocky rotation. They've created this action through the tip of the whip, and the arm is basically the last thing to move at the end of the throw. That's why it looks like the, the arm finishes the throw, rather than the body and the neck and the head and everything yanking together finishing the throw. It's directed through the tip of the whip. And you might say, well, isn't the body the thing that's supposed to be throwing the ball? The answer is yes and no. You want to use the body to build potential energy and proper positions during the start of the throw. But by the time that energy has actually worked its way up the chain, up the chain, up the chain into the arm, there should be no more movement from the torso, from the front leg, from the back leg, you're trying to minimize motion elsewhere. And so you'll see a relatively quiet head, a relatively quiet torso into bar release. Obviously the deceleration is gonna happen, but from landing into acceleration, there shouldn't be a ton of yanking. There shouldn't be a ton of torso motion. It's really just rotation and the arm should be the thing that finishes the throw. Again, he's not the best example of this. We can put up a couple other examples of this, but basically talking about as soon as he's gotten to this position, you should see very little motion from the rest of the throw. Right, how, how quiet is his front leg at this point during these frames? How quiet is his head? He's not yanking a ton. His glove arm is quiet, his back foot is quiet. He's transferred this energy so effectively that the last thing to go is the arm and then he goes into his deceleration. So directing that intensity through the tip of the whip is a cue that we'll use for guys who, they kind of have like a muscled up finish where everything kind of comes together. The torso yanks, the arm yanks, maybe the arm flies out. Um, and so we will use that cue pretty frequently with them to help them understand, hey, by the time you actually get to the end of the throw, let the arm finish the throw. You just don't want to bring the arm into the throw too soon or that can lead to a muscling up phenomenon. Guys, we're going to end there. We could go on and on about Diego Castillo's mechanics, uh, but this video is getting a little bit on the longer end. So uh, we're going to end it there. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe to our channel if you are not already subscribed and if you found this content valuable. Uh, with that being said, I will see you guys in the next video.